Turn to the book of Titus, Titus chapter 3. We've had somewhere around 10 sermons on Titus, three chapter book and um, letter, really, in fact. And this is our last one. And as we move into the fall, we'll be going back what we did last fall and winter into the book of Genesis and looking at the life of Abraham. As we're going to look at the text today, we'll see a, a fitting conclusion to uh, the text we've been working through over these last couple months. So Titus chapter 3, and I'll start in verse 9 and then go through verse 15. This is the word of God. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we look at this text, what may seem like a greeting to us on the surface, Father, we realize is still you're inerrant, you're inspired, the Word of God, which written to a certain application, God has application, which was written to a certain situation, has a relevant application to us as we consider our own lives. And so, Father, as we consider this, send your Spirit to help us to see what that is, to apply it to our lives, to apply it to our church we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is so easy to get distracted, isn't it? Uh, for some of us, it's a real easy thing. Some of us are probably more distractible than others. I was reminded of this movie uh, called Up from Pixar. You might remember the movie Up. And in it, there's like a good guy dog and there's, a bad, and there's three bad dogs. And these three bad dogs are extremely menacing. One's a Doberman Pinscher, I think. One's like a, a bulldog. And there's another pit bull. In other words, the scariest looking dogs you could see. And they're sent on a pretty evil mission. And they're intense and intimidating until a squirrel runs by. And they all pick up the head and they say, squirrel. And they could be in the middle of their evil monologue, you know, telling all the horrible, dastardly things they're going to be until that squirrel runs by to distract them and put them in another uh, direction. All of us have our squirrel, don't we? Uh, today, many of our squirrel is that ding or that buzz on your cell phone and or that thing that comes up on Facebook. I don't know what it is, but I can be in the middle of a conversation with my wife and something happens and I lose the whole thing. Distraction comes. I mean, for some of us, it could be a girl who walks by it could be someone who says something to get our attention. It could be just some, somebody saying something about money, which gets us to think about that. Distractions. In fact, our whole commercial order is probably built on taking you away from what you're paying attention to, distract you enough that you, they can get your attention on them, only to have another distraction probably come another minute. Now, others of us are more focused uh, but I think we can all relate to being distracted at some point in our lives. We're distracted at work. We don't put our best in. We get distracted on the road. Read that over 2,000 fatal accidents happen every year in the United States from distracted drivers. That's not to say how many accidents happen. That's just fatalities on the road, Two thousand over 2,000. We're distracted from our family at home when our mind is on our problems, on social media, it's back at work. Distraction is powerful and it keeps us from doing our best. And distraction can also keep us away from, from God. I'm not just talking about the distractions which maybe you faced in here, whether it's in your family or something happening around you or even within your own heart and with your own mind. I mean, it is easy to be distracted from God in the day-to-day -day life in this world. D distractions which divert our eyes away from God, where we lose our sense of purpose, why we're here, what we're doing, what love is, what joy is, what peace is, distracting us and having us look somewhere else. 
Distraction can happen in the church, too. Now, as we come to this letter of Titus, this is a letter which is written to a Christian leader for guidance on establishing and building churches. It was helping Christians, helping churches to live for what they're supposed to. And the ministry they're called to do, the things they're called to do as a church. In this case, when we read Titus, the Apostle Paul is the mentor, and Titus is the student. You have really a student-mentor sort of relationship here. That's why I appreciate uh, the growing grace groups that, that Pam mentioned earlier. Mentorship takes place. And in that mentorship, the life-to-life mentorship is really critical. Here you see the Apostle Paul mentoring Titus, the student, on caring and building this church. Now, throughout this letter, as we've worked through the last couple months, we've learned things like the importance of elders and, and of spiritual leadership. We've learned of, of the value of good doctrine. We, we've seen that God has a specific call and purpose for us at different parts of our lives, in older age and younger age, as men and women, um, in the workplace, and even in ministry. And, and we've learned how the grace of God changes us and transforms us, that how God has forgiven our sins and, and poured out grace on us and then called us to good works. I mean, there is a lot that's in this letter. It's, it's a letter of life transformation. It's a letter of church transformation. It might be short, but that doesn't mean it's not valuable or full of, of critical things for the Christian life or for the church. It changes lives. It changes the world. Now, unless we're diligent to apply those things, we can be easily knocked off of our mission. We can get wrapped up in in all kinds of things that keep us away from our primary purpose. And and some of those distractions can be straight up sinful, and they can be wrong. There, There is no doubt that some of the distractions that we have in our lives are that. Some of the distractions are just wasteful. They're a waste of time. Others, things are, are more benign, good things that we could be doing, when maybe there are better things that we could be doing and need to be doing. Now, Titus 3.8, just jumping back one verse from where we started today, if you have your Bibles, open there. If you don't have a Bible, we do have ones available on this little table back here. Please get one every week. That's fine. Bring one home if you need one. But Titus 3.8 gives us a picture of what we should be doing. It says, this saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things so those who believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. So the result of the work of God that we see here, and we've seen this over and over, the result of the work of God in a person's life is good works. The result of God's work in, inside of a church is good works. Not for salvation, but as a result of salvation, working its way out. Now, the Bible goes on to even show that these good works have been planned out by God before the beginning of time. If you look at Ephesians 2.10, it's just one example. We read this, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. What about those good works? Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What, he's being, what we're being reminded of as we look at a passage like that is we have plenty of opportunities that God is laying these things out for them. Will we walk in them? Only if we don't get distracted in them. Only if we're aware of them. And that's what we need to ask ourselves this morning. Are the things that we're doing keeping us from the more important things that we should be doing? Are we distracted in the home, in the church, at work, in our community? Are we distracted with God? Are the things that we're doing distracting us from future good works? And I know a lot of us are missing out on opportunities. But we don't even know that because we're distracted. We're distracted by social media. Our sins keep us in guilt. They keep us in shame, covering up our mistakes or keeping us from reconciling critical relationships. Or we're going after the mighty dollar. We're missing out on the service that we could be doing for the people around us. Our heads are buried in the ground, buried in social media, buried in self-absorption, buried in entertainment, and, and buried in conflict, rather than the empowered Holy Spirit, which God gives us through Jesus Christ. One author wrote that we are amusing ourselves to death, so amused with life that we miss out on good works that God has for us. Now, here's the thing. 
Titus keeps bringing us back to the amazing grace of God is given to help us to move forward towards God and towards others in those good works. And so I want to pull out three things from the passage which helps us to examine our lives, to, to eliminate, to avoid distraction, really ultimately to stay on mission. What is this mission that God has for us and to stay focused on that? All right, so look at, listen to the instruction of, that he gives in verse 1 through 9 as he talks about eliminating distractions. Verses 1, uh, Titus 3, it should be Titus 3, 1 through 9, talks about eliminating distractions. And so uh, here, here are the instructions. It says, avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. So in those three verses there, we see two things going on. We see problem topics and problem people. Problem topics and problem people. Uh, the first thing you notice is the problem topics. Th times of purposeful distraction away from the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. And you can see the list that he has here, starting in verse 9. Foolish controversies. You know, when I think of foolish, it really, I think of foolish first and foremost out of, out of Psalm 14.1, which says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God, and there is no God. Foolish controversies are the sort of controversies which are, are godless controversies. In other words, they're, they're controversies that don't matter for godliness, for worship of God, knowing he, who he is, or becoming like him, becoming the person that God has us to be. Now, there, there are controversies that matter. There are controversies that matter. Uh, they are not foolish. The, the whole book of Galatians is about a worthwhile controversy. The Protestant Reformation was built on the goal of reclaiming the gospel, and um, it, was a, it was a controversy, protest movement, if you will. And, and some controversies help us to clarify what we believe about the gospel. Those, those things can be important. They have value. But diversions away from the simple gospel is given to us in the, in, in the scripture, from the historic faith is handed down to us, uh, diversions which take away from the truth, don't help to live godly lives. Um, you know, those things, he says to avoid those. Uh, s some people want to push controversy on, you know, just because they want to live the way they want to live. They don't want to make changes. And so let's stir up a little controversy in order to, so that I don't really have to change. Just let's create enough doubt. Let's create enough chaos and confusion around us so that we can do what we want to do. All right, so no foolish controversies. The second thing he says is genealogies. Uh, maybe those ideas that who's more important than others on the basis of an ancestry. You know, you could see that this would lend to a racism or, or unbelief or superstition or speculation in this pagan world. You know, you know genealogies, he addresses those. We also see the distraction of dissensions. Instead of focusing on what unites the church, you see an effort on, on highlighting differences talking less about Jesus and talking more about the gap that grows in politics or child raising or abstract theological beliefs. He goes on next to talk about quarrels about the law, distractions to focus on small matters of what's right or wrong and to lose track of the gospel message. I mean, sometimes we can talk about preferences of our own as if they are commands from God when the Bible doesn't say much about them. No, so what are we to do with those things? You can see the command here. What's the command? Avoid them, right? Avoid them. It's not to say that there are differences. It's not to say that there aren't matters of controversy. It's not to say we're not going to have different convictions about small matters. Those things will exist. I even started to think about some illustrations about, about uh, what might fall into these categories. But then I remembered, what does it tell me to do? It says avoid them. So no illustrations, right? My kids, they can probably tell you about little rules inside of our house. I mean, some of those rules, even if they grow up and they decide to live differently, you know, I know that we're still going to be friends, and I don't bring, I try not to bring them into here, um, you know, because I've learned this. The more controlling that you are, the more rules that you set, the more you create divisions and fissures and things that just don't need to be there, even inside of your own family. So he says, avoid them. Right? Instead of, instead of getting entangled in these things, stay focused on the gospel. 
You know, we stay connected to our doctrinal core. Yeah, what is it the Bible teaches? You know, what's our understanding of, of, of the Scripture? You know, we, we have things like, like Westminster Confession, the Catechisms, as, as navigating us through the important and clear parts of Scripture, remaining silent on other matters. Now, as a church, you know, our calling is to make Christ known. Our call is to preach repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. We call people away from sin, away from rebellion against God, and to faith and obedience to him. We help people find forgiveness for any hope, eternal life. Okay, there is one example. This is a recent one. A person once called, and they were trying to decide whether to go to church here. And the question was, what is your position on Israel? Now, I think I know what they meant. I think I know what they meant. But I thought, I mean, is that really the most important matter? I mean, is that really the most important matter? In my opinion, I mean, it's the kind of question that gets into dissensions and controversies, unnecessary things. You know, I think the people of Israel need Jesus just as much as the people in America. I mean, it's that simple. It's the gospel message, keeping the gospel message the main thing, the main thing. Now, it's the same thing with you. Are, are you living in distraction? Or are you keeping your focus on what God's call is to you? Are you looking at the good works for your family, good works in the, in the workplace, good works in the community, good works in the church, or are you getting distracted by things, things like you list up here? Avoid them. Now, the passage goes on uh, past these problem topics, the problem people, right? Um, that's the first is the behavior, avoid those things. Second is the people. How do we deal with them? That's because some people just love to live in controversy. They just love to live in drama. Uh, sometimes they have an agenda. Sometimes they're just perfectionists who have to get things just right. They have to get their own way. They have to show their rights. They may even do things in the name of compassion, but they destroy all unity within the church in order to, to, to push these things. There can be a controversial type person. And, and as he writes this in mentoring Titus, he's, he's reminding them a divided church is distracted from the mission that God has for them. How much sin and conflict has kept churches from their mission of making Christ known? You know, one thing I've noticed is that when, when churches or, or people get off focus, they stop talking about Jesus. They stop caring about whether people are saved and whether they're going to heaven. They begin to speak like the solution um, to our biggest problems are human solutions, better policies, or, or sentimental love. They talk about right living and good techniques. They can talk about all kinds of external things, but not the internal things of repentance and faith towards God in Jesus Christ. People lose confidence that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And when they lose confidence in that, they stop talking about it. Ta talking less about Jesus. Talking more about the contraries of our day. That's why they're unprofitable. They don't help people follow Christ. So the instruction here is clear. Help divisive people build towards the unity of the church or help them out the door. Right? There's a three-strike work of church discipline. You, you, see the, you see first, though, is patience. Right? You see the first thing that you have here is, 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 is patience is connected with, with firmness. Right? This isn't about um, divisiveness over real sin. Right? I mean, sometimes people bring up real issues that are really of importance, and people say, you're just being divisive. It's not talking about those things. It's not talking about gospel and, 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 and doctrine, you know, key doctrines. This is about a person who would divide over small matters, falsehood, even false doctrine. And he says, even in those cases, there's patience. Just like Jesus provides guidance in Matthew chapter 18. We want people to do the right thing. We want people to be steered and directed in the right way. We give benefit of the doubt for people. You know, people want to be part of a community that, that seeks the Lord together. And you can see that in the way he writes here. You know, the, there's a step one conversation, right? There's a step two conversation. You know, those are before you get to step three. So there's lots of communication that's going on here. Lots of interaction that's going on here. How many times do we often lash out or respond uh, quickly the first time a person might challenge us? We need to be patient in that. But if after a period of time you see a person persisting in, in divisive behavior, uh, there's, he says, have nothing to do with that person. 
It's because he wants sin. He wants to think well of himself. He wants others to think well of him. He wants to do what he wants to do more than he wants Jesus inside of his life. He's even willing to break apart the bride of Christ, the church for which Christ shed his own blood. Jesus loves his church. Jesus died for his church. He wants to protect his church, and he sets himself up against anyone who would undermine it. That's why, why we see here that that person is self-condemned. I mean, if you're that divisive person, if you see conflict always around you, you know, that's something you need to address. You work through those things. Listen, you can make, you can do wrong. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, we can. Because you don't want that to describe your life. So this is the rule for the church. We think about our, so that's the rule for the church. Let's think about our own lives in this. Is are we diligent to avoid distractions? Are we ready to eliminate the things that keep us away from Jesus? What's distracting you right now? Social media, the relationship you shouldn't be in, giving the wrong people too much entry into your mind, your own false beliefs. Is there something you need to set aside that you focus on the Lord better? Eliminate those distractions. All right, that leads us to our second point, our second point, which is on verses 12 through 13, Titus 3, 12 through 13, where there's a call to organize for mission. Look what he says in verse 12. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I've decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. Okay, so the Apostle Paul is writing this letter, and not only does he provide guidance for Titus and the next things that he needs to be doing, but he gives this logistical instruction. You know, I think of like a chess master or something, you know, putting the right pieces into place for the future, for some future moves. Right? Titus' job was to appoint elders all the way back in chapter 1. His appointment uh, to new elders would provide long-term leadership inside the church. Titus was a short-term missionary. He wasn't going to be there long. He was working his way out of a job. That was his point. They would stay there the long term, and he wouldn't. And the Apostle Paul, he says, I'm going to send a couple guys there, or one guy, either him or him, and they're going to replace you there. So Titus really is a short-termer on the island because he has another thing he needs to go do. So go to another city called Nicopolis. And he needs to know what that assignment is. So that's why he's going to leave there and go to the next place. Notice what else he says in verse 13. He mentions Zenus the lawyer and Apollos. Now those men probably delivered the letter that we're reading here. They probably brought the letter to Titus. There was an expectation that it would be read in front of the whole congregation. So it really was to Titus and the whole church as he communicated these things. Uh, but, you know, these guys are like the postal uh, carriers of the day. But really, they're missionaries. And you see what he says to them. He says, do your best to help to speed them on their way, see that they lack nothing. You know, you can imagine, they need housing, they need food, they need money, they need transportation. You know, whatever they needed, Titus and the church there was to see that they received. You know, and so you get this picture, what matters? What matters? What's their mission? It's to make Jesus known around the world, right? That's their mission, make Jesus known around the world. Provide hospitality to missionaries. Financially support these missionaries, they have important work to make Christ known. Send them on, and then you come so we can make Christ known in some other places that need to hear it. It's a call to organize our church. It's a call for all of us to organize our lives for the mission of making Christ known. You know, really, one of, the, one of the best ways to get rid of distraction is to commit ourselves to live with intention for Jesus Christ. We find that we have vast amounts of time to waste to do things that, that uh, don't make much difference for eternity, you know, it's a reminder to us that maybe we need to volunteer to help the people around us. Maybe the good works that need to be done are ones that are going to take away some of our comfort. But we just don't commit to it. Right? We, we, we don't want to be constrained in any way. But meanwhile, we have all this wasted time, and, and we see that there's an unfruitfulness as we look towards our future. But so many opportunities around us, helping with church, getting involved with mentoring, p people who are in need, help going on a mission trip. Somebody told me how that they went on a mission trip and they were amazed and relieved uh, to see how they didn't even need to use their phone for a whole week. And they were fine and happy without it. They didn't struggle with lust. They, they felt satisfied. 
You know why? Because they're helping other people the whole time. Right? Committing to Christ. Going and serving him. And that activity in service of Christ gives less of the other time for waste. It's really one of the reasons why I like being a pastor. You know, I mean, if I stay focused on what I do, and I can get distracted as anyone else, but if I stay focused, I'm rarely without a chance to serve someone, to call someone. There's so much to, there's so much to do that I shouldn't have time to be focused on myself. Um, you know, I'm a sinner, I'm finite, I, I still do get distracted. You know, but if I stay in the work, you know, it, it keeps me focused and it, and it keeps me out of trouble. And, you know, as, as I go through life in this, I think, you know what, really anybody could do most of this. We can all make a phone call. We can all write an email. We can all read the scripture. We can all just offer to pray with someone. We get to know our neighbors. Now, it might mean organizing our lives so that we have enough time with our children. It might mean that we downsize our lifestyle, maybe our houses, our cars, our vacations, so we can spend more time with the people in our lives. Maybe avoiding distractions means having more time as a husband, a wife, a parent, as a, or even as, a, a, even as a child. But if we're so focused on living a certain lifestyle, we may miss out on the relationships that matter, us, that matter the most. We can also learn how to share our faith and make time to meet people around us. For some of us, just adding some margin into our life will give us time to meet our neighbors. For others of us, we need to purposely take time with somebody. Maybe we can take a class learning how to share our faith. Robin was just up a little bit ago talking about, hey, you can learn how to share your faith with Evangelism Explosion. He represented the missions committee. Again, ways that we can get active in mission for Jesus Christ. It might mean that we prepare a guest room in our house to provide hospitality for somebody in need or missionary. As care groups start, it might mean organizing your life so you can spend time with others to know their needs to pray with them, to be involved with them in the, in the mission of the church together. And some of us just need to organize our days so we spend time in Bible study and, and in prayer. Some of us, we're not even caring for our own family by reading the Bible and praying for them. We're distracted, distracted from the things that matter. We need to organize our life around mission. What is it that God has for us? It won't happen if we don't make time for us. It's been, it's been said that a failure to plan is a plan to fail. Right? So we stay organized in our mission. All right, the third thing I want to look at today is the call to organize for good. We see this in Titus 3, 14, and also in verse 15. Look at verse 14. It says, And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not to be unfruitful. This is the final call in this book to good works. Now, the phrase good works, and my challenge when we started was to find all the instances of good works inside of the book of Titus. I'd encourage you to do that again. It's really a kind of a main theme here, and we know it is because it's repeated six times. Six times in three short chapters, you know, it's an important theme. Now, it's not the most important word. It is a pretty important word. I think the next verse really highlights the most important word, and that's the word Grace. The word grace, you can see it's the very last five words. Grace be with you all, right? Four times that's used, the word grace. Not as many, but the way it's used shows its importance. It's the final word. It's the word that drives us to good works, right? And so we need to see that connection of, of grace and good works. The grace of God reminds us that when we were in greatest need, when we had an urgent need, God met it. He took his resources and he solved our need. He gave his son to redeem us from our sin. And once we see that, it helps us to see how we're surrounded by urgent needs. There are so many needs around us. There are financial needs, marriage needs, parenting needs, needs of justice. You know, I noticed that Central Virginia Justice Initiative um, insert in your bulletin, you know, caring for those who are being human trafficked. You know, those are urgent needs which they're addressing. But, you know, there's needs of justice. Children have needs. People are suffering near us. They're suffering all around the world. And here's the question. Are we even in a spot to do something if we become aware of them? Are we aware of them? You know, there's this warning that's given to us not to be unfruitful. What is unfruitfulness? It's a, a life that has potential, but it, it gives up that potential. It gives up those opportunities. It doesn't grow in the person. The person doesn't grow in the person they could become. They don't do the things they could do. There's unfruitfulness that's there. 
What if you come to the end of your life just to realize that you've wasted it? You spent it on your life, on yourself, your pleasures, and you have nothing to show at the end. You've not built into any others. You've alienated your loved ones. You're alone. You may have a lot of money. You may have no money. But your relational bank account is empty. So is your spiritual bank account. You haven't served God. You're about to die. What will happen to your stuff then? It's a waste. It's unfruitful. Unfruitful for eternity. It's a sad place to be. Now, you don't have to end that way. I don't care how unfruitful you've been. You can still be fruitful. You know who shows us that? The thief on the cross, doesn't he? You know, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, next to him were two scoundrels, two thieves. They'd wasted, been unfruitful with their lives. That's why they're being crucified together with Jesus. But yet one of them we still talk about today, right? And it's why. You know, he was the one who who turned to Jesus and he said, let me into heaven. Remember me, right? And Jesus forgave him. We still talk about him. You know, as long as you have breath, we're reminded you can have a fruitful life. You know, that, that man still bears fruit to this day in that story. You can still bear fruit in the lives of other people. And so what do we do? We can see even in that story, we make much of God. You know, we start with worship. We start by confessing our sins and, and professing faith in Jesus Christ. And then wherever we are, we look for opportunities. John Piper in his book, Don't Waste Your Life, says, God calls us to pray and think and dream and plan and work not to be made much of, but to make much of him in every part of our lives. Part of a prescription of not wasting our life. The most pressing need in the world that people around us face is about the need of sin. The most pressing need we can see is the lostness of the people around us. I mean, as hard as it is to say, is that people are dying and going to hell around us. And many in the church act like they just don't care. The failure to make Christ known is a way that a church will be unfruitful. Now, I read this parable recently, and it showed me how we can be so callous to the needs of others. It's a book that William Booth wrote, called, and it's a longer book called the, A Vision for the Lost. And this is a little short, short expert, uh, me and the pastors were reading together, um, Vision for the Lost, and it's a parable that he tells. He says, I saw a dark and stormy ocean. Over it, the black clouds hung heavily. Through them, every now and then, vivid winds moaned, and the waves rose and foamed, towered and broke, only to rise and foam, tower and break again. In that ocean, I thought I saw myriads of poor human beings plunging and floating, shouting and shrieking, cursing and struggling and drowning, and as they cursed and screamed, they rose and shrieked again, and then some sank to rise no more. And I saw out of this dark, angry ocean, a mighty rock that rose up with its summit towering high above the black clouds that overhung the stormy sea. And all around the base of this great rock, I saw a vast platform. Onto this platform, I saw with delight a number of the poor struggling, drowning wrenches continually climbing out of the angry ocean. And I saw that a few of those who are already safe on the platform were helping the poor creatures still in the angry waters to reach the place of safety. On looking more closely, I found a number of those who had been rescued industriously working and scheming by ladders, ropes, and boats, and other means more effective to deliver the poor strugglers out of the sea. Here and there were some who actually jumped into the water, regardless of the consequences in their passion, to rescue the perishing. And I hardly know what gladdened me the most, the sight of the poor drowning people climbing on the rocks, reaching a place of safety, or the devotion and self-sacrifice of those whose whole being was wrapped up in the effort for their deliverance. As I looked on, I saw that the occupants of the platform were quite a mixed company. That is, they were divided into different sets or different classes. And they occupied themselves with different pleasures and employments. But only a very few of them seemed to make it their business to get people out of the sea. But what puzzled me most was the fact that though all of them had been rescued at one time or another from the ocean, nearly everyone seemed to have forgotten all about it. Anyway, it seemed the memory of his darkness and danger no longer troubled them at all. And what seemed equally strange and perplexing to me was that these people did not even seem to have any care, that is, any agonizing care about the poor, perishing ones who were struggling and drowning right before their very eyes, many of whom were their own husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, and even their own children. You know, what a, what a story. You know, what a parable and what a picture. It makes us ask, who, who are we? Who are we in that story? Who will we be? 
you know, do we see the souls of many dying condemned and ignore them? Or do we get involved and in going in, going after them, making Christ known? The good news is it's not your job alone. It's the job of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the question is, will you get involved? And even if you can't go on missions, can you pray? Even if you can't be part of Robin's class, can you pray for those that they go visit? Are you giving? Are you giving to make it happen? That those who don't know Christ would know Christ? Or are you distracted by more trivial things? It's a powerful reminder of the mission that we're called into. And the powerful background the Apostle Paul knows as he writes and finishes this letter. These are not just idle words. This is mission for his church to get involved, to go out. And it's a reminder to us for our mission to the world. So what do we do? We eliminate distractions. We get organized for mission. We commit to do something good. And we can never the whole time remember that word of grace. You know, that, that's the word that motivates us. What Jesus did for his church, what he did for us. You know, we can just think of his life. What his mission was. His mission was to save his people from their sin. And he came in and he lived this perfect life. And he died in their place. And he rose again from the dead. He puts us into that purpose. He puts us in that love. He puts us in joy to make that known. That's because you won't live a distracted free life. Distraction free life. You won't live a undistracted life. I mean, the ease that we get um, of being distracted from God, it shows our sinful nature. It shows how much we need grace, how much we need God, how much we need the Lord Jesus Christ. That's because we work on it, we grow in it. But Jesus, he's the only one who actually did it. Right? God doesn't expect that perfection for us. Jesus did it in our place. Even when he was tempted, even when all these shiny objects are set before him, he resisted the devil and he stayed on his mission, organizing his life from eternity past to do the work that he was called to. And he continues to bear fruit in the world. He was, you know, think of that story again of, of the people drowning. You know, Jesus is the one who dove into the water to save us. And in our dying condition, you know, he gave his own life. He died saving us. I mean, that's love. He did it for a reason. He did it to reconcile us to God as God builds a people, as God sends a people out on mission. He did it so we'd be on that mission. So we'd see the needs of others and engage them in his name. Will we do that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are distracted people who live in a distracting world. There is so much that goes undone in that distraction. We thank you for our Savior. He was so focused on his mission. He saved us from our sin. He brought us into a covenant relationship with you. God, that's love. That's love. And Father, now that we know his love, as we remember his love, help us to see the urgent needs that are around us and to do something about it, to pray, to seek, to speak, to care. We need your grace and help. We trust that you'll provide what we need in Jesus' name. Amen.